Hey, Bilavel here. Before we start the show, I have a quick favor to ask. If you're enjoying the TED AI show, please take a moment to rate and leave a comment in your podcast app. Which episodes have you loved and what topics do you want to hear more of? Your feedback helps us shape the show to satisfy your curiosity, bring in amazing guests, and give you the best experience possible. Ever since internet modems found a place in our homes, people have been logging on, sometimes simply to look at all the crazy stuff the web has to offer. And since then, that need has been fulfilled by online communities, where creatives come together to inspire each other and share their techniques. Sites like DeviantArt gave artists a space to showcase their diverse digital creations. Newgrounds became a hub for quirky flash games and animations. And Vimeo began as a humble community for aspiring filmmakers. In recent years, you probably noticed AI-generated art popping up on your social feeds. Those eerily surreal portraits or fantastical landscapes that look almost too perfect to be real. And with a new type of creation, a new platform has emerged for this style of art, Civitai. It's a hub where beginners, professional artists, and engineers alike are experimenting with the latest models like stable diffusion and flux, tweaking them, developing new techniques, and sharing their workflows. As the community has grown, so have the tools, becoming increasingly accessible and blurring the lines between all the roles one can play within this ecosystem. With just a few clicks, anyone can go from consumer to creator. But what does this really mean for the value of art? And what are the risks and rewards of democratizing technology capable of creating almost anything? I'm Balavo Sudu, and this is The TED AI Show, where we figure out how to live and thrive in a world where AI is changing everything. Your business is modern, so why aren't your operations? It's time for an operations intervention. The PagerDuty Operations Cloud is the essential platform for automating and accelerating critical work across your company. Through automation and AI, PagerDuty helps you operate with more resilience, more security, and more savings. Are you ready to transform your operations? Get started at pagerduty.com. Hi, I'm Bilaval Sudu, host of TED's newest podcast, The TED AI Show, where I speak with the world's leading experts, artists, journalists, to help you live and thrive in a world where AI is changing everything. I'm stoked to be working with IBM, our official sponsor for this episode. Now, the path from Gen AI pilots to real-world deployments is often filled with roadblocks, such as barriers to free data flow. But what if I told you there's a way to deploy AI wherever your data lives. With Watson X, you can deploy AI models across any environment, above the clouds helping pilots navigate flights, and on lots of clouds helping employees automate tasks. On-prem, so designers can access proprietary data, and on the edge, so remote bank tellers can assist customers. Watson X helps you deploy AI wherever you need it, so you can take your business wherever it needs to go. Learn more at ibm.com slash Watson X and start infusing intelligence where you need it the most. Support for this show comes from Aeon's Health Solutions. A thriving organization starts with a thriving workforce, but providing quality health and benefits today requires bold action. Aeon is your ally in challenging the status quo. With predictive analytics to forecast your health risks, expertise to transform insights into innovative and financially sustainable solutions, and tailored strategies to meet the unique needs of your people and organization. The time for convention is over. The time for better benefits decisions is now. Visit Aon.com to learn more. Much of what we once imagined about the future is here. Pocket-sized radio instruments will enable individuals to communicate with anyone, anywhere. But this reshaped reality is also filled with thorny questions that aren't so easy to navigate. Welcome to Shift, a new weekly podcast from PRX. I present to you Electro, the Moto Man. Ladies and gentlemen. I would say that one of my greatest skills is my ability to interact with you. I'm your host, Jennifer Strong. You can learn more at shiftshow.ai.
To help unpack these questions, we're joined by co-founders Justin Meyer and Maxfield Holker. Together, we'll explore the future of content creation and consumption, the dead internet theory, and why not safe for work content remains on their platform. All right, Justin and Maxfield, welcome to the show. Thanks again for having us. Yeah, good to be here. So everyone's got their origin story, and I'm curious, what first drew each of you into the world of AI and creative tech? Do you want to go first, Justin? So Max introduced me to Midjourney in August of 2022, and I don't know, I'd been watching the development of AI image for some time. I was fascinated by what I saw with Dali, and I've always been a creative person. Engineering always came more naturally to me. But being able to use kind of my engineering skills uh, to, to modify prompts and, and go back and forth with AI was just game-changing for me, empowering. How about you, Maxfield? Yeah, I started playing with Dolly uh, way back before Midjourney was a thing and like just an open Google form that you could actually mess around with it in. And I made some of my first images of just myself like melting into a, uh, into a landscape image that was just like completely... <laughs> Uh, like pixelated and destroyed. And it was really interesting to kind of like see this kind of new art form that was less human made and more computer made. Yeah, it's interesting. I think Midjourney for me as well. And I think this is what 2022 Midjourney V3, I believe, when people really started playing with it to like just be able to query this sort of distillation of human creativity and and get something back was super exciting. Um, and of course, that is also the year open source AI really took off, right? We had stable diffusion and image generators pop up. So I'm curious, you launched Civitai a few years ago, and now it's drawing in millions of visitors every month. What did you fix in the world of AI creation? Like, what itch were you scratching when you first launched this product? Can I take that one, Max? Yeah, please. It's your vision. I made that leap from mid-journey into open source image generation because... Midjourney's unlimited plan was only kind of unlimited. I had to go slower and slower. <laughs> and so I, I needed to find a new outlet for my hobby. And Stable Diffusion had just been released. And so I got really active in that community. And every time somebody would post an image, people asked, what's your prompt? How'd, how'd you make it, right? And people started to make custom models. They'd, they'd add new concepts. They'd add new styles. They'd add new characters, things like that. And so Civitai was really aimed at solving that problem. We wanted to make it so that people could find all of the models, all of the resources that they needed to make something in one place, and that any time they posted an image, we would capture all of the information about how it was made, including the, the, the models that were used to make that picture. And a whole lot of social features kind of grew out of that because you know people needed to be able to talk about these awesome things that they were making. So that was the itch. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting because... You're totally right. Everyone was very obsessed with what prompts you're using, but it's more than that. And so your platform kind of has the full chain of custody, the full workflow that was used to generate that image. For the uninitiated, could you talk a little bit about open source AI and what it means to sort of create these like fine-tuned models and, you know, people throw on terms like LoRa's, like, can you just break that down simply for those listening? <laughs> How would you break that down, Max? I think that you can break it down more simply than I can. I love complexity. It's <laughs> yeah. a problem. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah, let me think about that. So let's see, you have general base models that are usually made by big corporations that have millions of dollars to be able to throw at that um, because they just require so much training data. Uh, LoRa's and embeddings are fine tunes that you're able to make off of those base models for use with those base models to be able to further tweak and kind of get that last 10% of image generation of what you're trying to get concept-wise without you know, having to have kind of the, the deep payroll and pockets to be able to find a fund that. I would say that's like the, probably the highest level <laughs> section of like what that allows. Yeah, building on that, Max, do you want to just break down maybe some examples of the kind of fine tunes your community is making? Like, and some of like maybe the cooler examples that you've come across recently. World morphs are probably the thing that has mm. been the most interesting to me since the beginning, which is this idea of, uh, you know, what would the world look like if everything was waffles or if everything <laughs> was made of wires or if everything was made of uh, felt. Like coffee cups? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was all felt. And then to be able to, the ability to be able to stack that with different styles, right? So here's like a realistic image if everything was made of felt. And then here's what a image of everything was made of felt was if it was made in like a Studio Ghibli anime style as well. And 
the layering of those kind of complex concepts on top of one another is really where open source shines because you can't do something like that really reliably with any of these closed source tools. And the ability to do like specific phases of human expression is really interesting. Um, I think that's something that a lot of generative AI struggles with is the ability to do specific facial expressions. And being able to have like trained concepts like on facial expressions is really, really cool because again, you can kind of get exactly what you want out of that. So is it fair to say it's kind of like a fancy way of like filtering or focusing what you get out of these models and getting like a consistent aesthetic or style that somebody else could then reproduce? And I love your point about stacking those pieces together, too, because it does feel like there are all these like Lego primitives available on the open source side that you don't really see on the closed source side. So, well, they eventually end up having some way to do mid journey has their like style reference thing like it slowly comes about. But the moment a paper drops, you know, you see this coming out in open source almost immediately. So I'm kind of curious, like before you built this, Justin, like what was like the ecosystem? Like where was collaboration happening? You mentioned Reddit. You want to break down sort of what was the center of gravity for the community before Civitai and then after? Yeah, I think the issue was there kind of wasn't a center of gravity. It was so distributed, right? Like there were different communities kind of all around the world. You know, some of the people were focused on tooling and some people were focused on model development. Some people were focused on, you know, whatever that latest research paper was. And it all came together on, on Civitai. I mean, it, it, it totally makes sense that community is a focus because Civitai is derived from the Latin word for community. But what about online community is so important for making open source AI work? unlike perhaps all the other approaches to building out these AI creation tools. With, with closed source development and, and things like that, it's really up to the small teams inside of a company and all of the resources that they have behind them to push something forward. With open source development, re really what it comes down to is how productive a group of people can be in continuing the development of something. And this is kind of like a new type of open source movement where the way that people push things forward is, you know, not necessarily through software, but through training. Um, so it kind of creates this new type of distributed training that doesn't really exist inside of these, you know, companies inside of these closed sourced uh, models. Instead, it's allowing a lot of people to kind of add what they think needs to be added and then people to grab what they want from that pile. And so community is critical because it essentially makes it so that people can find and provide that niche that they do best. Basically, without a community, open source development doesn't really happen. Yeah, it makes sense, right? Like why, why trust a small number of anointed product managers to make decisions about what to build for absolutely everything? Let the community yep. decide. Yep, exactly. And Max? No, I was gonna, I was gonna say, um, it's less about open source AI as it is about open source content as a whole. Like the, what's interesting about this is it's pushing a new boundary in terms of just generally new content, which mm. is that it's no longer static and more interactive. It's more customizable and personable to you know the person who's actually viewing it. The interesting thing about that is that when you break away from the tools themselves, it doesn't matter if they're open sourced or closed sourced or anything else, what it matters is, is how easily can you replicate that content because of how much of it has been cataloged. Mm. So yeah. the art itself has like a full stepping stone. I mean, it's and it's a whole new idea. Imagine if you had a YouTube video and it showed like every piece of equipment that was used, every shooting location, every angle, every lighting feature, every like rough setting on every piece of equipment they were used for how to make that video. So you could really accurately go out and recreate it exactly. Um, that's kind of like what this is, is the ability to completely recreate and then be able to then remix and change uh, media on the fly, um, which is which is cool. Yeah, it's open source content. It's a really interesting way of putting it, Max. It's like we saw like, you know, a sliver of this with perhaps like, you know, the, the rise of TikTok and the ability to like remix content essentially or like splice stuff together. And it, it always reminded me of, I don't know if y'all remember Photoshop tennis on like Reddit communities where somebody would upload a photo and then somebody else would add something to it. And then like through the course of that conversation, you could see this like meme basically like, you know, uh, come to life. And uh, we saw that in a more static rudimentary sense again, with these short form platforms. But yeah, what you're describing now, the ability to look at something and then basically take it and like, yeah, remixing it uh, is like, is, isn't is even fully capturing, like recreating it and then taking it in whatever direction you want uh, is super exciting. And uh, yeah, it seems like there's nothing else out there quite like it. 
In my mind, it's like totally the new age of media, right? I mean, even this podcast, uh, if you think about 10 years from now, it'd be like, I don't like the guests that are on here. Let me just replace them <laughs> or let me replace the concept or let me replace the the people who are on it. Like, I don't want this Max yeah, guy talking. Yeah, I can't talking stand Justin's voice. Let me get that. <laughs> yeah, let me replace <laughs> that with, uh, that. let me get like, uh, you know, David Attenborough voice this guy instead. Um, you know, that's a really cool idea. And I like that a lot. And maybe this is foreshadowing because we'll definitely come back to the lines between reality and imagination blurring and the various implications uh, therein. But kind of kind of bringing it back to Civitai, it seems like open source was so fundamental. And Max, to your point, kind of the inherent remixability and being able to see sort of the full, you know, ingredient list and, you know, the, the set of instructions to reproduce and remix something is really cool. Um, but clearly, y'all just announced Spine and you're also embracing closed source tools like Eleven Labs, Kling, Udio. How do you think about the open source and closed source movement? And how does Civitai evolve in this sort of world where we have to live alongside both type of tools? I think uh, ultimately what we've seen is that the best content isn't using just one tool. You know, they'll they'll start generating their image using an open source model like Flux that has a few LoRa's on it. And then after they make that image, they'll go take it into a video tool like Luma or Kling, and then they'll add music to it using, you know, Suno or Udio. And, and what we saw is that essentially, hey, people want to be able to use all these tools to make content with the end goal of being able to support this new medium that Max is talking about, where like we can completely recreate content and make it remixable. You describe Spine as what AOL was to the internet, Spine is to AI art. Can you elaborate on that? And please do keep in mind that some of our listeners are younger than 30 and do not remember a world oh, with- What is AOL? <laughs> what is AOL installation disks for crying out loud? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess for those that aren't familiar with AOL, it basically made it so that the internet was all accessible in one place, right? You could do your instant messaging, you could do your email, you could find your stocks, all of the, the stuff that people were kind of doing on the internet at the time. And in a way, essentially what we're doing now is trying to bring together all of the tools that people are using to create content using AI into one place in the same way. So that now, rather than having to know all of the different things or knowing what the best tool is at a current time and trying to figure that out, we can help you, you know, just find something that you think is interesting will allow you to swap out the the video that was used with a, a different, you know, animation or an animation style or something like that. And and now rather than having to figure out where to go to to do a specific thing, you can come to one place that kind of brings it all together and see, you know, based on the best content that's being made, what's right for what it is that you're trying to make as well. I love it. Love it. Uh, okay. So it, it's interesting, right? It, it, the essence of being able to have visibility into how something was created stays the same. But since people are using closed source tools, you can now kind of encapsulate that information as well and kind of make those workflows accessible to other creators. Like I've talked to designers and big tech companies too that are like, yeah, I'm on Civitai all the time downloading models. <laughs> and they're also like, I got to be really careful about what I have on my screen. <laughs> so people think that I'm actually working. And so this is one of the interesting <laughs> things about open source, right? Um, not safe for work content has been, interestingly, a huge driver of many aspects of open source AI art. It's a part of Civitai. Uh, can you explain why to our audience, you know, not safe for work content has been important um, in the evolution of open source AI? Uh, a couple things. I mean, I think first and foremost, it's a cliche, right, that all new medias and formats are push pushed forward by porn, but <laughs> it's a true cliche. It's a cliche for a reason. In a lot of ways, like the people who are pushing this actually have like a deep need and desire to want to make this stuff. And they're also the ones that are pushing the technology forward. In our mind, we we wrestled a lot when we were first starting Civitai. Do we have a separate uh, section for not safe for work or do we not allow not safe for work? The thing that cinched us for it and that like we needed to maintain, maintain it was the multi-usability of these resources, right? Like how many different things they can be used on. I, for instance, at the time, one of the best models that was for doing anatomy was actually a porn model because it had been trained on the most amount of like, you know, human bodies, obviously. So it was being used by tons of people who were not doing anything that was not safe for work. But they were using this porn model because they were just getting the most accurate representations of like human figures in different poses. And at that point I think, you know, Justin and I had a conversation where we like we can't we can't close this stuff out. Um, like it has so many more uses beyond just what it's being advertised for and what it could potentially be used for. I don't know. Would you add anything to that, Justin? Yeah. No, I just I agree with you. Essentially, what we saw is that 
this energy that people are putting into producing, you know, adult content, mature content with AI was ultimately pushing the quality of the model forward. And so it was important for us on that side of things. We wanted to make sure that we could support everything that people were making with AI. And like you said, part of the draw of open source tech was those limits that were being placed on you by these closed source platforms didn't exist, right? You, you could make all kinds of things, good and bad. And, uh, you know, being able to be a space that could support that hasn't come without challenges. And we've continued to learn and grow and do our best to kind of uh, put put the rails in place at least through our site as well, but uh, it's definitely it was it was a a difficult decision, but I'm I'm happy that we made it because I think that it kind of makes a, a unique experience and it allows us to be the hub of all things AI, not just you know half of it, if you will. It, it, it is interesting that the earlier uh, versions of Stable Diffusion were really good at anatomy. And then when Stability went through scrubbing pornography from their training data, suddenly there was this massive degradation, you know, in how you reconstruct anatomy. But I have to imagine there were some like moral and ethical quandaries that y'all had to deal with. For example, CSAM. Like, I know y'all have made a huge attempt to reduce the amount of not safe for work content on the platform itself. And there were instances of people using some of these models to create, you know, CSAM content. What was that journey and experience like, you know, kind of putting the rails back on there? I'd love for you to go into a little bit more detail. Yeah, it was, it was an interesting learning experience for us because obviously when we were putting it together, we were like, oh, you know, I, I guess we weren't really aware of how depraved people could potentially get with this. So like CSAM hadn't really even entered our minds when we were putting together this site. And when we were first confronted with it, we were like, oh, okay, got it. So we should, we need to start making some moves here really quick to be able to kind of limit this. So one of the first things we did was put together some content policies that we considered common sense content policies around like what we would consider not only, you know, obviously legally what you can put on the internet and what we're allowed to host, but also ethically what we thought was was right, both around content for real people and for content around minors. For instance, one of the things that's still a rule today is that we don't allow any photorealistic depictions of minors on the platform, period. And that's purely just for the reasons of like, again, it has too many too many possibilities of potentially being misconstrued or abused by, by people. And then we don't allow any depictions of real people that is not in a... Um, uh, either like a work or school type setting, essentially, that like you wouldn't allow to be used in those environments. And that includes poses as well uh, as facial expressions. And our our main thought process around that was kind of like, hey, we're, we're both dads and we're both married. And, and it's like, do we, do we want, would we want to have our own kids or our own spouses like portrayed in this way? No. So let's try and, let's try and put some rules in place to prevent that. And you're of course talking about sort of the non-consensual deep fake problem, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Justin, anything to add? Yeah, I, we hit new milestones all the time of the amount of content being uploaded. And so having to kind of handle the volume has not been without challenges. And we've had to make, you know, unique models of our own to help detect stuff. Um, and it's been, a, it's been a journey and we're constantly improving it. One of the things that we uh, committed to back in, uh, I think we kicked it off in, in like September of last year, actually, was we, mm. we started working with uh, Thorn along with a few other AI companies in the space to prepare a white paper called Safer by Design with the intent to really start to, I guess, start to establish kind of the, the norms for reporting on, on what we see and kind of handling these models so that we can kind of help, I don't know, make things safer in the future. Um, things are inherently not very safe right now. It's the Wild West. It's a whole new frontier, right? And that doesn't come without risk, doesn't come without danger. And so really what we're trying to do is think about, okay, if this is where we're at right now and this is the wilderness that we're living in, what does it look like in the future? How can we make things safer in the future? How can we start to handle this volume that that's coming at us as, you know, people are generating billions of images a month now? We do actively work with government organizations like NICMEC, as well as others to kind of combat CSAM in general. And it's been helpful to have their support as well and kind of understand how we can do our part to help fight this problem as it kind of takes on, an, on, on a new shape, if you will. There is this dichotomy you often have with open source, right? Like you trust people and give them agency to do whatever they can with minimal guardrails. And you want to put minimal guardrails there because that's how you foster innovation, right? And maybe on the other end, end of the spectrum is you have a bunch of these closed source models who might, uh, uh, who, where I might add, there are some other ethical quandaries where clearly they're training on all this type of data. 
they don't just let you prompt it. If I take IP as an example, I can't ask Dolly for Godzilla, but if I ask for a dinosaur, you know, with a really long tail, like I'm going to basically get Godzilla. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, so the question is, where does enforcement happen? Does it happen at the point of model creation? Does it happen at the point of generation? Does it happen at the point of distribution? And I'm kind of curious if you have any thoughts about that, since you are really deep in on the model creation side, but now you do have, you know, inference capabilities and you're offering workflows. But then again, you can't really control distribution. Right, right. Yeah, I think ultimately it's going to have to be both. Uh, one of the interesting challenges with open source tech is you can't really control what people do once they have the model in their hands. So the best you can do is kind of control what you're training on. We actually kicked off something called the Open Model Initiative back in June, May, shortly after SD3 was released. And people are like, hey, we got to start building our alternative of our own driven by the community with, a, with an open license. And one of the decisions that we made early on as we were kind of talking about what that data set should look like is, sure, we can have mature content. We need to be able to capture human anatomy, but let's keep that separate from the ability to create children, right? So there's already some work that needs to be done kind of at the, the model development side of things to make sure that, you know, at least you're producing and releasing something safe. Now, what people do after that, that's that's the joys of open source. Could be could be dangerous, but that's where that second part comes in, right? And and where we're enforcing things like the ability to control what comes out of those models. So really, ultimately, I'd say that it kind of needs to be both. But I think thinking even further down the pipeline, what are people doing with that content? Really where we should be managing this stuff is on the sites where it's getting posted, on the tools where it's being shared. Can we instead enforce policies around what people are doing with the stuff that they're making. But they have the ability to somehow get around filters that are put on by TikTok and Microsoft and be able to produce content that they shouldn't. Shouldn't it be on the platforms where they're sharing them to like prevent the spread of that content that shouldn't be made? So I think that that's kind of like where I'm imagining the ultimate like filter should get applied. But certainly got to do, do stuff on both sides of that equation. Totally. It sounds like we need a full stack solution. But to your point about you know, what the community is doing with these models and these capabilities. In 2023, there were about 10,000 unique creators that contributed models monthly to Civitai. What drives that level of engagement? Like this, like, you know, like small minority of ultra super users, if you will. Uh, I, I think Max would jump in and say clout as the first answer. <laughs> I could see I could see it in his mind. We have leaderboards. I'm, I'm a big gamer myself. Max is as well. And so... We understand how incentives work and we want to encourage the community to participate and engage and, and give them the means to continue to create. Um, and that's kind of where Buzz comes into play. But before even Buzz was introduced, I would say that the first thing that motivated people was, you know, hey, I want my name to be up in lights. So to access certain tools on Simitai, you use a currency called Buzz. And you can purchase Buzz with currency or earn it through content creation or contributing to the platform. Mm -hmm. How does this work and how does it play into the creator economy that y'all are constructing, Max? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When we were transitioning from having everything be free to, because originally, you know, like all generation, everything on the site was free for anybody who wanted to use it. Uh, and we realized that obviously that's not sustainable. We have to actually, you know, be charging a fee, especially if you want to start supporting a creator economy. Mm. Then the other thing was like, okay, well, you can, you can give value by actually you know interacting you can give value by giving your feedback on the models you've used by producing images every image that you produce you're giving some value back to the community itself whether people use that for training data whether they use that to actually like better hone prompts or whether they just use that as feedback on their own resources that they've created every interaction you do in the community is has, has value and we should you know be giving you value accordingly for that and our solution to that was buzz right and so the idea was like let's give them buzz as a way of saying hey thank you for interacting with the community and also here's how you can then use that to now use this now paid generation service because it uses uses the Buzz platform. And then we can use that to then fund the creator economy. The creator economy as a whole is like one, I think, one of the core goals that we had when we were setting out uh, for getting Civitai going. We noticed that, I mean, you've, if you've talked to any of these creators, you know how much like time and sweat and like tears and Austin cash goes into creating some of these resources, especially like the really high end ones. Like it takes a lot of money and a lot of time uh, to do this well. And uh, a lot of these people are just doing it for free, and it's like that doesn't make a lot of sense. So we got to get them some kind of kind of payment here, especially with all the people who are benefiting from it. And the creator economy really stemmed from that idea of like, okay, we got to make sure that these people are getting compensated correctly. That led us into the buzz system and how we've kind of 
distributed that in two ways. So creators have two ways of earning on the platform right now. They have an early access system where they can put a resource up uh, kind of in the spirit of open source rather than making it just a purely behind a paywall. You can put it up for 15 days, uh, essentially, as early access. And then we also allow a split for all generations that are done on the platform itself. So uh, creators get, I think, 25% now, 25% of uh, all buzz that's spent on any single image generation. But yeah, no, we have more plans for more ways for creators to be able to monetize in the future. Uh, but those are like the two main ones right now. And they've been going pretty well. We've been getting some good feedback from people who've been using them. You're totally right. Like an open source, people are putting a disproportionate amount of time into essentially like, you know, uh, a public commons community resource so to see, a, you know, a community where you can make money and get a slice um, of even your model being used to create an image. That That's really, really cool. Are there different personas for the types of users that you end up seeing? Like, I have to imagine some are like the regular model contributors. Some are there just like, I don't know, paying and downloading models. Um, others are creating content on the platform itself. How do you all think about the the various stakeholders that you serve as Civitai? Yeah, yeah. Uh, pretty, pretty early on, we kind of divided them into three categories. Um, and they each kind of serve a different purpose and they kind of build on each other. The, the first class of user was what we called our creators. Um, they were the people making models that then attracted our next class of users called enthusiasts who would then go and take those models and create images, create content, which would then attract the next class of users, which is called consumers. So uh, we, we kind of treat them in those layers and in that way. And what we found is that you know, there's a ton of consumers. There's basically, you know, 90% of our users are consumers. The next 9% are enthusiasts. And then the top 1% are, are creators, which I hear is pretty common for the power for these kind of, yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So one of the interesting things about this, though, is that there's kind of less barriers than ever before to move up that stack. And so one of the things that we're constantly pushing for is figuring out ways to help consumers become enthusiasts and to encourage enthusiasts to become creators. Because you don't need to be, you know, some super technical person to figure this stuff out. Because at this point, now anybody can create. You just need to have a good idea and AI can kind of hold your hand to make that thing awesome. Your business is modern, so why aren't your operations? It's time for an operations intervention. The PagerDuty Operations Cloud is the essential platform for automating and accelerating critical work across your company. Through automation and AI, PagerDuty helps you operate with more resilience, more security, and more savings. Are you ready to transform your operations? Get started at pagerduty.com. Hi, I'm Balaval Sadu, host of TED's newest podcast, The TED AI Show, where I talk with the world's leading experts, artists, journalists to help you live and thrive in a world where AI is changing everything. I'm stoked to be working with IBM, our official sponsor for this episode. In a recent report published by the IBM Institute of Business Value, among those surveyed, one in three companies pause an AI use case after the pilot phase. And we've all been there, right? You get hyped about the possibilities of AI, spin up a bunch of these pilot projects, and then crickets. Those pilots are trapped in silos, your resources are exhausted, and scaling feels daunting. What if, instead of hundreds of pilots, you had a holistic strategy that's built to scale? That's what IBM can help with. They have 65,000 consultants with generative AI expertise who can help you design, integrate, and optimize AI solutions. Learn more at ibm.com slash consulting. Because using AI is cool, but scaling AI across your business, that's the next level. Speaking of money, I have to ask, uh, so y'all raised a $5.1 million seed round last year uh, led by Andreessen Horowitz. The AI landscape has shifted a lot over the last year. How do investors view your refined mission now? And are you having to deal with this pressure to perhaps be profitable uh, versus your original mission that's, you know, focused on art and community? Like, are those incentives perfectly aligned or is there some tension there you're having to contend with? It's interesting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, there is pressure to be profitable um, and there is pressure to, to be a business. The cool thing about this medium, though, is that 
unlike traditional art where, you know, it's on a single person to go produce a piece of work and there's not really ways for other people to put money into it. It's different, right? Like we have lots of room to monetize on top of services that people want to use. And so reaching profitability is something that I think will only become more and more sustainable. It's actually funny. Part of the the pitch that we were sharing was that when we added monetization, when we turned on the buzz system and started charging for generation, we actually saw an increase in the amount of engagement and an increase in the amount of creators within the community. So it, it's cool because it actually makes art and, and community sustainable in a way that kind of doesn't exist right now because it adds this whole new way to participate that naturally attracts dollars. So I'm hoping that we can keep it that way, that we can make it sustainable. And uh, so far, it seems like we're on track. But certainly getting that funding helped us. We had thought we could bootstrap it initially, but doing that for a million people at once is just a hard thing to do when you're a small company. Love it. Anything to add, Max? Yeah, I was going to say one of the things that's interesting is that everybody looks for comparables, uh, especially in the in the VC world of like, you know, what what industry are you upsetting or what who currently are you like turning over? Are you replacing? Are you doing whatever with? And it's very hard to come to. It's like, oh, no, we're actually like designing a whole new form of content and content consumption. It, it does feel like it's not just about creation. It totally is about consumption, too, and how that's shifting. You talked about this notion of remixability. It's kind of making creation more accessible in the sense that you don't have this blank canvas problem, right? Like suddenly you have a starting point or you have multiple, you know, primitives that you can put together to make something else entirely. And one of the things I think about is going back to the shorts analogy of remixability, is how quickly these platforms like kind of reverse engineer your soul, like they figure out what kind of content you like. And of course, you've got, you know, user generated content on one end, you've got, you know, users on the other and an algorithm that sort of does the matching. And I can't help but imagine in this future that we're headed to where content will be, you know, personalized, disposable, created just in time for you. How do y'all think the future of consumption is going to evolve with the kind of tools and capabilities you're building? I love the way that you're thinking about it. I completely agree. I think that, I mean, with so much content that can be created now, there's no reason that all of it won't be personalized for you. Like, even if it was something that was made by somebody else, if it was made in a language that's not native to you, it'll be translated. I mean, why wouldn't it be, right? Um, so I think that, you know, it's it's going to be interesting to watch the bubble that we're kind of already sitting inside of with these algorithms serving us exactly what we want to see taken even to another level as it's further personalized to you and kind of what what those limits might be. Are, are all advertisements going to include pictures of me or pictures of family or pictures of the person that it thinks that I'm going to be most attracted to or something? It, it's kind of wild to think about what those constraints might be and and how how we still kind of have a collaborative experience inside of that, right? Like if everything's personalized, how do we connect? Can we view the same content, but have it have minor differences in there? Can I still connect with you around the story of, you know, um, Breaking Bad or something like that, even though there was parts of the, the series that I saw that were completely different than yours? It's going to be interesting to see kind of how the world shifts as content as we see it today is more like a universe than a snapshot. Hmm. So I'm looking forward to that. The universe analogy is an interesting one. And, and I did hear your quote, uh, don't build movies, build universes. And yeah, it's, it's at the heart of the question that I wonder about this. Like, what is the future of shared experiences? Did you watch season, you know, 17 of CSI Miami or whatever? Is, is that going to be the case? Like these kind of shared stories and experiences that bring us together versus kind of being lost in our own islands of personalized content. And one of the things that kind of fuels into this lately is every time I ask somebody like, hey, what's your like favorite YouTuber? I'll, I'll get like three new names and I'll look them up. They all have like millions of followers and I have never heard of them. And so then I just imagine layering generative AI on top of that. And it's just like this turtles all the way down infinite fractal. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm curious if that like uh, evokes any responses in y'all because it seems to be headed that way. Yeah, no, um, I'm, Justin and I have talked about this a lot. My personal view is yes, uh, we essentially just go into rabbit holes of our own 
media creation and we never emerge. Uh, <laughs> like there, there's, there's, because there's going to be no incentive to. I mean, why would you, right? Uh, yeah. It's like if, if you look at the popularity of something like TikTok, and TikTok's entirely like it's, it's an algorithm that also happens to have content, right? Like that's, that is what TikTok's value is. And you give TikTok the ability to then generate this content on demand on the fly for everything you want to see ever, like you, you just never will get people off of that. It'll, be inescapable and i think that's going to be the fate for large portions of 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 the uh, of the uh, <laughs> uh, population for sure it, it it reminds me of that scene in wally where it's just like people like floating around with their like headsets and it's just mountain dew straight to the vein um <laughs> and, and honestly uh it, this also brings up a really fun um you know kind of chemistry both of y'all have as co-founders here is you are like a bit of an odd couple where Justin, you strike me as far more of an AI optimist. And Max, <laughs> like, I, I don't want to call you a pessimist, but certainly you have a more pragmatic perspective. Uh, I, 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 I consider myself a realistic optimist, is there the word we I go. Use, which means pessimism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice way of saying pessimism. Um, I am curious, like, how does that dynamic play out when you're building this company and making product decisions and figuring out where to take stuff? I think it works really well, personally. Most of the features that come in get, go into the platform itself are Justin's brainchild, and he gets there from getting feedback from the community. We take, spend a lot of time getting feedback from the community. And then it's always fun because then he'll be like, oh, we should do it this way, we should make it this way. And it's like, no, people will absolutely abuse that. Like, <laughs> we will be laundering money if, you, if we implement that. You know, like, we can't do that. Um, and so it's... It's nice. Max basically will tell me all of the ways that people are going to abuse it because he has got that pessimistic view. And it's like, oh. It's like the red hat, you know. Like Saves the, us tons of legal fees, right? Because I just do all the live. You're right. You're right. We can't do that. <laughs> um, so it's great for for like platform building because it's it's a good balance in terms of like, okay, well, like this is something we really want to put in, but you know, how could it go awry? Right. And then usually most of the time, you know, I even though I think one of the one of the plus sides of my pessimism is like I part of me really wants to see it go awry. So I still am like going, let's just do it. Anyway, let's push it regardless, because I wanna I wanna see what breaks. And that means that we end up pushing out a lot of cool features really quickly. So it's, it, it works well for the platform, I think. I love that. Um Maxfield, do you think your worldview contributes to your belief in the dead internet theory? And can you explain what that is to the uninitiated? Sure, yeah. My personal definition of dead internet theory is this idea that we replace enough of the content on the internet with content that mimics actually coming from other people or that you could be indistinguishable from coming from other people or you just don't care if it comes from other people uh, to the point where it loses all inherent value. And there's no real reason to be on the internet as a whole, except just as an entertainment device. Yeah, no, I think we're actively contributing to it. I think AI is actively contributing to it. And I personally find that to be a great thing. I've been disillusioned with the internet for years. <laughs> and I would like the entire thing to burn down if possible. So <laughs> if we can help it, then I'm all for it. Justin, what do you think of Maxfield's belief in this? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I sit here laughing because... He's talked to me about this so many times, and he's not wrong. I mean, it's definitely going to be a challenge. It's so easy to make so much content, so much AI slop, as they call it these days, yeah. <laughs> that it's just the beginning of it all, too. It's going to require us to kind of think differently, and the internet's going to have to change. Like, how long until only 10% of the content of the internet is something that was made by a human? And I guess the other part is, like, does it really even matter? Like, it won't that, matter. there's people that I already wish I didn't actually have to talk to that I could just like say, <laughs> hey, LLM, be me to talk to this person so that I don't have to manage this relationship. Um, like, a so, like, like a digital twin of Justin delegated yeah, to manage. Yeah, this can we have the Justin agent take care of things for me? That would be great. Every time I'm like forced to go on Twitter, I'm, I'm like, you know, this would actually be better if these were AI chatbots. Like, I think it would actually be a better experience if the entirety of Twitter was just AI chatbots. Because as it is, it's like, I, why am I forced to just experience this like slop all of the time? So I agree with you. Uh, it, it is inevitable. And, and like, it's this weird thing where... You know, I'm I'm doing some prompting to take my few bullet points to turn it into an email, and then the other person's using an LLM, the new Apple intelligence, <laughs> to summarize it. It's like, wait, couldn't mm -hmm. we have just sent the bullet points? And so it's this like compression and decompression uh, that's happening, but still kind of human intent at the at the core of it. But you could easily see that change, a la the the fully generative TikTok feed example that we're you know kind of uh, speculating about. So I have to ask, what do you think? creation looks like in three years from now? 
I think the thing that makes it still difficult is I, I look at how quickly video has moved over just the last year. I don't know if you guys mm. have seen like that Will Smith eating spaghetti from like yeah. a year ago <laughs> compared to like today where it's like, yeah, that could actually be Will Smith eating spaghetti. Um, I don't know. The, the auto-generated TikTok thing could be real. I wouldn't be surprised to hear that there was already automated generated shorts in three years. And maybe they're not fully personalized yet, but that they're probably working towards that. I think the other one that's really interesting to me is probably going to be game development. It feels like we're still thinking about, you know, how do we make things cost less? But really, there's only so much cost cutting that you can do before you, you know, change from looking at efficiency into looking at, okay, well, what interesting stuff can we do this with this? And how does that kind of change, change the game? Can you double click on that gaming point? Because it, it is interesting. I did get a chance to ask Jensen about this at GTC, his prediction that everything will be generated and not rendered in the future. And I think it's interesting to think about what happens when the model isn't the means for creation, but the model is the content in itself that you're experiencing. Um, does that spark any thoughts in you? Yeah, it, a few different things. Um, I had the opportunity to make my own little AI game about two or three months ago over a weekend. And using AI agents as essentially people that were managing the game, people that were characters in the game, people that were creating content for the game, it became pretty clear that like, hey, if we can already do this at this stage, and I did this in a weekend, definitely we're going to have these AI generated games where it's like you come in, maybe some of it's been structured by somebody else, maybe not but everything can be made on demand and it can adjust itself to kind of fit what you're doing. And I think what I am imagining is the majority of content that's going to be generated in the future is going to be stuff for games where people aren't there to create something. It's not about a creative act. It's about enjoying content. It's about exploring. It's about making choices and kind of seeing the outcomes. I think it'll probably change gaming and probably make a lot more people gamers that weren't before because now it'll fit whatever it is that you're interested in. Totally. Back to personalization. Yeah. So Max, everyone is talking about making movies with AI, right? Like that seems to be very popular on Twitter. But again, when I look at what content people are actually, you know, consuming with their eyeballs and driving watch time, it's a lot of short form content. It's a lot of memes that I think really drive a lot of attention. What do you suspect is going to be like the most dominant form of consumption in a couple of years? Same thing it is now, short form content. Right. Mm. I mean, our attention spans are only going to get shorter, if not already. I mean, one of the interesting things about Google, uh, when Google came out of the scene, right, is we outsourced a lot of our long-term memory to the internet. And we just kind of stopped enhancing that ability within ourselves. And as ChatGPT and other generative tools become more prevalent in our lives, we're going to be outsourcing more and more of our ability to uh, think, create, and really actually you know, engage. I mean, you know, one of the most popular forms of content that you can see on YouTube is after a new movie comes out is a bunch of explanation videos that are yeah. essentially, or recaps or reviews, right? Because people don't be like, I don't want to watch this movie. I want to watch an eight minute, you know, recap of it and have somebody tell me what it was about at the end. I don't have to think about what it was about. And in my mind, I think that's how like 90% of people engage with content now in, this, in the world is they want to just be given the short form section of it. Not because they're lazy, but just because they've conditioned their mind to be like, hey, this is like the easiest way I can get this dopamine hit. I've already at the point where I don't consume any media that's not at two times speed now, just because it's too <laughs> long. You know, I can't, I can't be bothered to to watch anything that's not at two x speed. Yeah, and it's also the volume of content is growing, right? So there's so much more for us to choose from versus like, you know, like the list of books, movies, TV shows, and certainly you know, uh, social media content is absolutely exploding. So this is like one way to make sense of it is just to speed run it all. And like, it was really interesting for me to see the explosion of Notebook LM. Uh, and people like getting like podcast summaries. So it's like whatever modality or medium or format you're most comfortable consuming in, you can kind of translate any content into any content. And, and it has that remixability aspect that I see on your platforms as well. Perhaps it's more on the creation side, but I could totally imagine it tending more towards consumption too. One of the more like sci-fi extrapolations of this is, you know, I now have like at least one AI tool that's that's records every single meeting I'm in and like checks every single email I send and has just building a database of me, right? I could see a very, very possible future where 
rather than having me on a podcast, I'm just like, hey, yeah, here, take here's take my AI equivalent and we'll do it. Um, <laughs> and then rather than even consuming a podcast, why would you even bother with that? You can have someone's AI equivalent and just ask them questions if you were interested in those questions. Or, you know, uh, I could take an AI equivalent of you and have you ask questions of my AI equivalent for me totally. and then get a different AI to summarize it for me. And then it's like, okay, well, you know, at this point, at this point, you know, like what even is like the most summarized form of content that I could possibly get out of all that, right? Do I even need to bother with any of that? Or can I just get a bolted list of being like, this is what this person believes, move on. I think in a, in a sense, it's almost inevitable. We are going to have a bunch of agents that we delegate to take on a bunch of interactions and they're going to be talking to each other, negotiating, doing all sorts of interesting things. So as we wrap things up, I'm curious for each of you, what gives art and creativity in this new world, deep value? And how does Civitai amplify that value for your community? You want to go first, Justin? Give me a second. Sure, sure. Take your 01 thinking time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to report exactly what exactly. I'm thinking for you. <laughs> exactly. No, it's cool. That's obfuscated. We can't see the real <laughs> chain of thought. That's not allowed. <laughs> uh, not to, we'll I'll, do the, I'll do a quick, <laughs> quick pass while you're thinking, Justin, if you want. Uh, Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I think the thing that's really interesting to me about all this creativity wise is the less human aspect of it, right? It's the idea of sure humans are giving some sort of uh, general guidance, but really what it is, is almost like kind of a ghost in the machine aspect. My, my favorite art that comes out of any of this is when people combine these resources and they give it no prompt whatsoever. They give it absolutely no, mm. uh, nothing to go off of as to what it should make and what it pops out is ethereal and strange and obviously it's just an amalgamation of the training data but it's it's different than what i would think a human artist would would think of making it has less intent to it to a degree um which is funny to me because it's like the the artists that i think we hold up on the highest pedestal are the ones that are able to convey um, emotion in uh, the most like transcendent kind of way so you're able to get a feeling of some sort without actually having like it being spelled out for you in some kind of art form and that personally is kind of the feeling i get from a lot of this just direct uh direct robot creation that has has no human intervention whatsoever um as these models get better they actually you lose a lot of that you lose more and more of this uh this like kind of static and more of like you get more and more intent from people and that's you know that's interesting too because it's cool to see these people who obviously have no classical art skills whatsoever would never be able to make these things otherwise are able to convey an idea that has value and meaning to them. And you feel like you're able to communicate with somebody on a, on a, a wavelength that you otherwise wouldn't maybe just through a conversation. Love that. What do you think, Justin? Yeah, I think, I think the thing I would say is really along with the end of what Max was saying there, I, I, I think the thing that I'm most excited about with what we're doing here is empowering every individual to be able to kind of create and communicate in a way that was very limited before. The required, you know, decades of training and experience and exploration and now you can you know see somebody else make something and make something of your own that's like that or better in 30 seconds you know i i think that that fundamentally changes the capacity for humanity to communicate and and i think that improving our ability to communicate is only going to help us work together better and that's really what i want to do is i want to help us kind of move towards the utopia that i dream of rather than the uh the possible dystopia that maybe Max Max is telling me is going to happen. Max, Justin, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks again for having us. Thanks so much for having us. All right. So talking with Justin and Max, I can't help but feel we're at this fascinating inflection point. What stands out most is how Civitai has essentially baked the entire creative recipe, every model, every prompt, every single step of creation right into the content itself. It's like having the tutorial embedded in the artwork, creating this unprecedented level of remixability and transparency. Whether you're looking at an image or video, you can see exactly how it was made and can build upon it. But this also raises deeper questions about where we're headed. As content becomes less static and more dynamic, almost personalized to each viewer, what happens to shared experiences? Are we headed towards individual bubbles of AI-generated content, each perfectly tailored to our tastes? Or will we find new ways to build shared universes together, co-creating and remixing in ways we can't yet imagine? And while Justin and Max might disagree on whether we're headed towards utopia or the dead internet, 
They're both helping build the tools that will define how we express ourselves and connect in this new era. As the lines between human and AI-generated content continue to blur, platforms like Civitai remind us that community and creativity will be crucial to whatever comes next. The TED AI Show is a part of the TED Audio Collective and is produced by TED with Cosmic Standard. Our producers are Dominic Gerard and Alex Higgins. Our editor is Ban Ban Cheng. Our showrunner is Ivana Tucker. And our engineer is Asia Pilar Simpson. Our researcher and fact checker is Christian Aparta. Our technical director is Jacob Winnick. And our executive producer is Eliza Smith. And I'm Bilavel Sadu. Don't forget to rate and comment, and I'll see you in the next one. Your business is modern, so why aren't your operations? It's time for an operations intervention. The PagerDuty Operations Cloud is the essential platform for automating and accelerating critical work across your company. Through automation and AI, PagerDuty helps you operate with more resilience, more security, and more savings. Are you ready to transform your operations? Get started at pagerduty.com. Something about the way we're working just isn't working. When you're caught up in complex A requirements, or distracted by scheduling staff in multiple time zones, or thinking about the complexity of working in Monterey while based in Montreal, you're not doing the work you're meant to do. But with Dayforce, you get HR, pay, time, talent, and analytics all in one global people platform. So you can do the work you're meant to do. Visit dayforce.com slash do the work to learn more.